you have your Bibles with you this morning, I ask that you turn to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, while you're turning there, uh, again, reminder to be with those of the mention for prayer and uh, make it a sincere matter of prayer. Um, you know, I'd rather uh, pray for one person and be effective in prayer than pray for a half dozen and just go through the motions. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 in the very first verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 in the first verse, the Bible says, But I determined within myself that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorrow, sorry, who is, it, who is he that maketh me glad, but the same that is, that is made sorry by me? For I wrote this same unto you, lest when I come I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice. Them of whom I ought to, uh, having confidence in you all, that the joy that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused, if any have caused grief. He have not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is his punishment, which was in which was in afflicted of many. So that counterwise, you ought thought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up uh, over much sorrow. Wherefore I beseech ye that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I may know the proof of, of you whether you be obedient in all things. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I in the person of Christ. I'd like to preach this morning, the Lord being my helper, the way to begin 2018. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you and give you great glory and honor for simply setting high on the throne this morning and having all things beneath your feet. Lord, we pray that you would be with each and every one that's meeting here this morning, that you would manifest yourself to them in a special way. Lord, uh, we pray that we would take in the seriousness of starting a brand new year in your service, Lord. And as our years fly by, Lord, that uh, you would become the center of more and more and more in our life. God, help us to have a spirit of forgiveness when even it's not deserved. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, I will say this, what I've seen in, in recent years, forgiving is not a common thing. Now, you might go through the routine and say, well, I forgive you, and it's just as empty as an empty cup. Forgiveness, it, it, see, the thing of it is, and we'll see by the Word of God, if you don't forget some, forgive somebody they're all against you, you're going to keep carrying it, and you're going to keep taking it with you, and you'll have no enjoyment whatsoever in the service of the Lord because that thing will always come first. And will always interrupt your time with the Lord. It will always interrupt your time with prayer. And we live in a day and age, you know, you hear about Generation X or whatever it is, the kids that was born right at the turn of the century, uh, they don't know forgiveness. They don't understand what it is to really say, I forgive you. Now, what, what we like is, is to have some kind of response from that. But what about when nobody acknowledges it? What about when nobody says, you know what, I forgive you too. Well, you're to forgive anyway. And you're to move on. Without that, there's nothing, there's nothing whatsoever that could be accomplished for the goodness of the Lord. Now, uh, in the first verse, Paul says that I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. Now, we're, we're fixing to see, if you read the first Corinthian letter, there was not a whole lot of 
good to say uh, about, uh, about what Paul said to the church at Corinth. There was very little that he said that uh, was encouraging. And the reason that he could not write an encouraging letter is there was so much sin in the camp. There was so much bitterness around. You know, it was to the point that they had a man uh, living and, and having a relationship with his stepmother. And, and the church would not address it. The church would not simply say, hey, buddy, this is wrong. This is not right. So Paul's first letter made it very, very clear what the problems were. And you know what? Sometimes preaching, it just has to be that way. And then he says, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to come to you in heaviness. I'm not going to come and be burdened down with your sin. And I really believe that well, what he had the confidence in the Lord is, was that was enough. That was enough to get the job done. That was enough that the ones that really belonged to the Lord, it was going to work out for them, and, and that would be meaningful to them, and that would accomplish what he wanted to do. Now, listen, uh, after pastoring for 25 years, I'll say this, sometimes I have to come in heaviness. Sometimes I have to come knowing full well there's problems and trouble within the group. And... Uh, then other days, you just have to give the Lord the trust and, okay, you're going to take care of it. He then says, For if I make you sorrow, sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad? So, he said, If I make you sorry, if it hurts your feelings with what I had to write, how am I going to get happy again? Well, the happy came this way if it was a good response. If people, you know what, if that old boy and his stepmama wasn't willing to get it right, let them leave the church. Let them, let them go on out. In fact, to the point, he says, listen, the next time you come together, vote them out. That, that, that's what he said. And, and so, you know, that don't make us glad. He, he said, if you got sorry about it, that's an encouragement to me. And when we preach on sin and we preach on our lack of interest in the gospel and dying souls all the way around us, if we, you know what, if you begin to weep over somebody, that's going to make me glad. Because I know you have an interest in the right spot. And that, that, that's what Paul was saying. If you get sorry, hey, I'm glad because that means you're grieving over sin and that ought to be where we're at. For if I make you sorrow, who is then that maketh me glad? But the same which is made sorry by me. In other words, you. And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorry, uh, sorrow, from them of whom I ought to rejoice. Now apparently he was planning to go back and church and check on the church at Corinth. And he says, when I get there, I want to be happy. I want to be glad. Now, you know what? If you go into a church that once abided by the truth, and you go in and they're looking like a bunch of worldlings, and, 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 and the women's running around in tight britches and the men half-dressed and uh, you know what, they're in here uh, preaching some heresy. You know what, that'd make me pretty sad, wouldn't it, you? That'd make me grieving. There's a lot of us that can go to churches we used to go of and we come out there sorry, yeah. uh, discouraged, ready to quit. And, and, he, and he says, so when I come down there, I don't know if he's going to preach a meeting or just to check on them or what. He said, the reason I wrote that letter is I don't want to be grievous or sorry when I get there. I want to rejoice. You know what? We ought to rejoice and be the gladdest people here on earth, but often we're not. He says, I did this simply so that we could enjoy each other when I get there. Having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. Now as I look uh, before my congregation this morning, I look or be able to look at every individual and say, she made me happy here. He, he did this, and what a great encouragement was to me. That's what, that, that's what he wanted to see when he got back to Corinth to preach again. He wanted those people to be in line and, and to be an encouragement to them. And you look around the building this morning, and it ought to be the very 
ashamed, not just because I'm your pastor, but each and every individual ought to be an encouragement to you. But you know what? What I have found, we look for the little nitpicky things that you don't like. And as long as you do that, and you know what? It may be scriptural. You know, it, it, it may have some sound basis. But what you need to do is pray for them and forgive them. That's what you need to do. You need to pray for them and forgive them and move on. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, uh, a lot of times what robs our happiness and what may make 19 a, a, a misery for you is simply not forgiving individuals. And that was a problem. Uh, verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of the heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more, unto, uh, more abundantly unto you. So, you know, uh, have you ever listened to a sermon and, and knew that the man, when he was preaching, he had his beads set on somebody and preached right toward that individual? Um... That ought not to be, first of all. You know, uh, I, I didn't know. I knew the man's son, but uh, there was a preacher at Bumpus Mills before, way before I got there, and his wife took on the role of the Holy Ghost. And if he was preaching against somebody, she'd turn around and look at him so they'd know for sure it belonged to them. And, 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 yeah, and you know what? Uh, that ought not to be. That, that, that shouldn't be the way people is. You know, when, when I preach a message on sin, it should grieve my heart. And if the Holy Ghost has truly given it to me, I, I, I may not even know who, who, who the Lord is using it with. And it ought to grieve me to know there's a problem. You know, when Achan got into that mess right after they crossed the Jordan River and he took of that stuff, the goodly Babylonian garment, you know what? Joshua said, listen, there, uh, God said to Joshua, there's sin in the camp. And you know what? That didn't make Joshua excited. It didn't make him happy. It, it made him worried. It made him upset. It, it, it made him concerned. And that's what Paul was saying to Corinth. Listen, I, I, it was a grievous thing, but I did it for you good. Verse uh, 6. Sufficient to such a man, uh, I'm sorry, verse 5, but if any have caused grief, he have not grieved me, but in part, that I may oh, that I may not overcharge you. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. So he says, if you're grieved, it's, it's not coming from me. You know what? This morning, if you have an issue with somebody else in this building, you know what? Deal with it. You go to that individual and you work it out. Because you know what? You're hindering me as much as you're hindering yourself. And that ought not to be so among God's people. We ought to, you, you, you know, uh, this old truck I bought, I ain't really, uh, I don't have sense enough, but I got a lot of help to look at the engine as closely as I should. I just kind of know that it turns. But, that thing, I do know this much about engines. It's all got to work together. And if it's not in unison, something is going to... In fact, the problem always gets worse, right? The problem... If, if you have a belt go off, then you're going to have more and more problems. The belt's just not going to be the problem. It's going to go into other things. If you have rust in your tank, you're going to have problems. And it's... You know what? The rust don't stay in the tank, does it? And uh, we're going to have the same thing. Uh, if, if there's grievances among ourselves and you choose to carry them over into, into 19, it will continue to cause a problem and we as the Lord's people will not move forward. Verse 7, so the counterwise, we ought to forgive him. So you, if you don't get anything else out of that message, instead of being upset at this individual, the opposite should be true. The counterwise, forgive him. Con forgive her. Forgive them. You go before them and you say, listen, I forgive. 
Now, see, that's the difference than us and some Baptists. If you think about it like this, uh, salvation is not asking you to forgive, for God to forgive your sins. That's Armenian, right? It's that He already done it. Right. That sacrifice happened centuries ago. And it was for us. For His elect. For His redeemed. Right? And that's where we ought to be. That, that's where we ought to operate. And where we ought to want to be. Is knowing the, knowing the very fact that we should forgive. We should be a forgiving, loving people. And you know what? I really believe this. The truly redeemed will want that. Now, listen. It's counterwise to the flesh. The flesh don't like it. The flesh likes to hold grudges. The flesh likes to remember things. The flesh likes uh, and, and make a mile out of molehill. Did you see how she looked at me? Well, you know what? She may have had something in her eye. It may be nothing. It may be nothing about it whatsoever. And you know what? She may be giving you the looks that can kill, but you forgive her anyway. Yeah. Counterwise. You do the opposite. You, he, and apparently this old boy, I don't know if it's one of them that he kind of <laughs> took hide hair and all, but apparently it wasn't going like he thought it should. And he says, y'all forgive me. Verse 8. Wherefore, or because of this forgiveness, this godly sorrow, wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. Now how are you going to confirm your love? Guarantee your love. Show your love. Now, I'm sure my daughters-in-law probably think that when they married into this bunch that they weren't real sure how they, what they got a hold of. Because we're not a real touchy-feely family. We just, we're just not. Uh, I didn't grow up that way. And uh, my wife knows I love her, and my children know I love them. Without me always going, I love you. Uh, you know, come, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not my personality. But you know, the best thing to show love, you know, out of the clear blue, just do something because they're there. Because, because they're an encouragement to you. And, and, and that shows just as much love as all that uh, mushy, goofy, goofy talk. Does it not? You know, when I've learned about stuff like that, you can say a whole lot, can't you? But it really comes down to what you do, does it not? You know why uh, I, I hit the bricks every morning besides the fact the Bible calls me to do that? Because I love my children. I don't want to see my girls and my wife go hungry. So I, I hit the bricks. And, and so we as Lord's people, that ought to be our own desire. And it ought to be what we get into. Is, uh, wherefore I beseech you that you confirm your love toward Him. How are you going to confirm it? You're going to confirm it by saying, I forgive. You're going to confirm it by showing, uh, you know, the Bible itself says this. He that would have friends, let him show himself friendly. And, and if you're going to do like this and, 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 have, and have a scowly face all the time, you know what? Don't complain to me when you don't have any friends. Just don't. I don't want to hear it. And uh, we, ought, we, ought to, we ought to show that love to everyone and anyone around. Show them that you love them. And, and, and move on. You know, don't, uh, don't, don't hold on to your own bitterness because it will end you. Verse 10. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. Now, this is where you Catholics jump in and say, See, Paul was Pope and he was forgiving in the place of Christ. No, read it in context. The context is this. If you show that forgiveness and, and, and you have that union together, he must have made it right. If this old man is running around with his stepmama, made it right, you know what? Them two might have been the shining bright lights of Corinth Baptist Church. I don't know. But if they did that, they would have forgiven him and Paul said, I'll forgive him too. In other words, every time you saw this woman who was running with her stepson, 
and she really made it right, you know what we would all do? She used to run with her stepson. Right? Right? And, and so we as the Lord's people, he says, listen, if you've forgiven them and they made it right, listen, it's time to move on. It's time to get over this. And you know what? I forgive them too. In other words, Paul was saying, because he apparently he's going to go preach a meeting there, I'm not going to have my beads set on this woman when I get there. I'm going to forgive them too. I, I, I'm going to move on. I, I'm going to continue in the things of God. And, and so as we pro approach this new year, why would you carry a burden forward that you didn't have to? To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it for your sakes, I am the person of Christ. Now again, you Catholics jump on. See, he was the vicar. He, he, he was running in the purse. No, no. I was acting like Christ. I forgave it because Christ was forgiven. I forgave it because they made it right and Christ would move on. That's why I did it. And, 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 and you think about how many, how many times as an apostle Peter fell flat on his face and uh, and the Lord just kept using him kept, kept, kept encouraging him remember when he said I will never leave thee nor forsake thee he said Peter before the cock crows you'll deny me thrice he got his rebuke <laughs> and, and you know uh, uh Remember what he said, a lot of people say that's when he was saved. I don't believe it. I believe he was saved in Matthew 16 when he says, Blessed are you, Simon Virginia, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. But he said this to him. After he said, he rebuked him and said, Peter, before the sun comes up, you're going to deny me three times. He said, but when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. Converted means changed. We need to change some things in our lives, do we not? Yeah. Well, we need to make things, different things, a lot of times a priority. Th things that really mean next to nothing, we put it at the very top of the list, don't we? And, and, and you know, sometimes the Lord God will, will take you through experience to teach you that. To, to, to let you know that you don't have it all figured out yet. He'll test your faith. And, and you know what? That's okay. We, we, we need that. And, and, and so, I asked you this morning what your ability to forgive is. How well are you at forgiving? And you know what? Uh, I, I've heard it said, and I've kind of used that myself, and what it becomes is nothing more than an excuse. Well, it takes me years to forgive. Well, shame on you. Now, what I have found with my experience with my father, it didn't take me years. The fact was this, I never forgave him to start with. And once I did, then I was able to move on, right? Uh, and, and, and you know, this, this is another thing. I've heard this all my life. Well, I forgave him, but I can't forget. Well, you never forgive him to start with. That's the reality of it. Um, because, you know, if you're suspect of somebody, you've not really forgiven them. If, if it's turning back in your mind, oh, I bet he does it again. I bet he does it again. Oh, there's going to be trouble. You've never really forgiven him to start with. And so we as the Lord's people, uh, in addition to heading into 2019, if you're having malice and envy and strife against somebody, but you said you forgive them, but every time you look at them, that's the first thing you think about, you've not forgiven them really. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to find a level of forgiveness that's like unto Christ. Why? Verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. 
So I want you to see two things. First of all, that what really is churning up those feelings and turning the cogs within you against this person, first of all, it's probably Satan. Satan is doing his job, and I want you to see that he says, Well, Satan, he didn't say get advantage over you. He didn't say get an advantage over me. He said get advantage over us. And who is this letter written to? It's not written to that man and woman that was running around together, is it? It's written to the church of Corinth. So when he said advantage of us, what I have to come to the understanding is this situation was affecting the whole group or it could affect the whole group. So in other words, if I have an issue with Brother Eric and I haven't forgiven him, it could affect you and you and you and you and you. And so that ought to make us take it a little bit more serious that, that we're dragging down the whole group, we're dragging down the whole church for something that we can't, can't sincerely say just say, I forgive and mean it. See, forgiveness is a... You, you know why it's so hard? Forgiveness is a work of the Spirit, not of the flesh. That's why it's so hard. And your flesh will stand dominantly and interfere with it. I like forgiving, right? You just don't know what I've been through. You just don't know what he said to me. Forgive him. Forgive him. Move on. And, and the Lord will bless you for it. So we as Lord's people uh, having an interest in our own church ought to forgive one another just so that we can have the power of God upon his people. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. So understand and know this. When you hold that grudge, you hand on a piece of Satan. You hand in one of his devices as a tool. You're holding one of his tools and you're doing it to tighten the wedges. And so we as Lord's people, we ought not to ever have any desire or whatever to do that. The Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 11. Mark 11. Verses uh, 24 through 26, Mark 11, uh, verse 24. Mark 11, verse 24, the Bible says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Now, I want you to notice, and it seems unrelated, but we'll get down a couple more verses and you're going to see where this is going. When you hold on to this mess, when you cannot forgive, it's going to start impacting your prayer life. Now, as soon as we think about prayer, we begin to think about, you know, Lord, let me have a red Corvette. Let me have a million dollars in the bank, blah, blah, blah. And, and we may be a little more humble. Let me have food on the table. That seems pretty, pretty minimal. You know what? It's still all about you. Yeah. But what about a prayer that says, Blessed be the name of the Father. Glory and high is He on the throne this morning. And never say anything else about your youngins, about your grand youngins. Just say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. That ought to be, you know, that's a type of prayer too. And apparently if forgiveness is not involved, you can't do that either. And not be effective. You can say it, but it end up being uh, what's nothing more than empty words. And, and so we ought to understand that, that this, is what it, uh, this is what happened. This is how effective our prayer life could be. Verse 23. And when you stand praying, forgive. When you stand praying, forgive. In other words, you get up there and you're ready to say, Blessed be that he that reigneth. And right about you're going to say it. You remember how she looked at you <coughs> when you got to preaching on dresses. And that little madness comes up within you. 
Better leave it alone. Go and say, Sister Sally, I'm sorry. I ask for your forgiveness for having those bad thoughts. And then you get back over there and say, Blessed be the name of the rich and mighty King of all the earth. Then you can do it right. Then you can do it with sincere, sincerity. But as long as we're carrying all this baggage around, and, and then we wonder why God don't meet with us. We wonder why the Holy Ghost don't come down and convict sinners of their condition. I can tell you, it's because of the junk we're packing around. Against people that we're to love as brothers and sisters. That, 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 that can be the problem. That way, that, that could be what churches today are so ineffective in their worship and praise and, and spreading the gospel. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have all against any that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. So apparently, our level of forgiveness is tied to Christ's level of forgiveness. Now that doesn't mean you're not redeemed. That's totally different. But it is your service. So if, I, if I'm carrying around a hiccup for Jared, you know what? When I stand before the mighty, the Lord God's going to say, what was your issue with Jared to start with? And, uh, you know, it might be, it might be significant. I don't know. But God's going to say, well, you didn't forgive him. You didn't forgive him. So now the problem belongs to me. And that's your situation this morning. If you've not forgiven an individual of any all against them, you've taken on the burden, and now it belongs to you. Verse 26. But if you do not forgive, neither your Father which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. So forgiveness is an important work. Forgiveness is something that we all want to be interested in and have a desire to be involved in. But you know what I have found? People saying, I don't care what people think about me. Well, what, what you're really saying there is my testimony don't mean nothing. I could care less about my testimony. You know what? According to the Word of God, uh, I don't think a saved person would do it, but just look at the Scriptures, because Paul makes allusions to this. Um, talking about religion, saying, listen, it's really... But it would be a violation of Scriptures, but as far as redemption... I could grow my hair down to here and live any way that I wanted to. But, and we look at that, who, who, what's the difference between that and forgiving? Right? I'll tell you because the way this stinking flesh works, if I grew my hair out shoulder length, you could see it. But I can't see your level of forgiveness. And you can't see mine, right? Right. And, and, and so we, as the Lord's people, we ought to have a desire and a hope and an interest to forgive people and, and, and make that our priority. Because what it is, it's going to become an obstruction between us and Christ in our relationship with Him. Mark 18, verse 21. Mark 18 and verse 21. I'm sorry. Uh, there is some Mark 18. Let me, let me find it. Mark 18.
Matthew 18 and verse 21. Matthew 18 and verse 21. The Bible says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me that I forgive him? Till seven times? Now, very familiar verses of Scripture, and, and Peter, always wanting to be the high and lofty one, says, how much am I going to forgive him? Now, I want you to see this, the wording there, because we often missed it, that my brother sinned against me. Now, if you sin, who is it against? It's against the mighty God of all creation, is it not? In other words, you can't sin against me. Now, you can offend me, and you can upset me, and you can hurt my feelings, but listen, I'm not the giver of the law. You can't sin against me. Does that make sense? And, and, and so, we as the Lord's people, when we begin to think about these little things people say and the little looks that they give you and all that foolishness, remember, it's not against, it is not a sin against you. Now, it may, be, it may give you a little alt and it may give you a little hiccup along the way, but you can't sin against mankind. That's an impossibility. Verse 22, And Jesus saith unto him, I say unto thee, until seventy times. Uh, but I say not unto thee, unto seven, unto seven times, but unto seventy times seven. Now, this is supposed to represent an innumerable amount of events, but I know, I know us and I know the nature of the flesh, and, and you know what 70 times 7 is? 490. And, and I know people has the disposition to keep up with it. And you are on 439, buddy. You're getting there. Right? And, and, and so we as the Lord's people... Uh, that ought not to be. That's a fleshly carnal thing. When we get down that we're picking bones apart so specific that we're making numbers, then it ought not to be so. We ought to love them. We ought to have an interest in their well-being. Verse 23, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven like unto a certain king which, had, uh, which would take an account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon one who was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. And listen, you owe God more than that. Right. But for as much as he had not to pay, and you don't have anything either, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment be made. Listen, I want you to get verse 26 because I want you to see that if you're, if, you're, if you're carrying these things around, it's affecting your children. What this says, is it not? You're teaching them how to be, how to hold grudges. You're teaching them how to, how, how to be difficult. You're teaching them how to be a scorekeeper. And, and that ought not to be. We need to be a forgiving, loving people. Verse 26. The servant therefore that, uh, fell down and worshipped him and saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him his debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. And we understand that that'd be about a dime altogether. A pence is one tenth of one, of one cent. And, and, and owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, and saying, Pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Uh, will pay thee all. And he would not, but cast him into prison until he should pay the debt. <coughs> so his fellow servant saw what was done, and they were very sorry, and came and told unto the Lord, at the Lord all that was done. And his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O thy wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy debt because you desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all 
that was due. Now, this is the method of forgiveness. If you if you don't think you can do it, if you're if you're redeemed, remember Christ forgave you. That's right. And there is nothing that a brother or sister in Christ or even a heathen out there can do to you that's compared to the violation that you have of God's law. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing whatsoever that could possibly be done of the amount of forgiveness. You know, the Bible says this, that He'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you know what? They don't describe one of us. You get that merit by grace. Yeah. So I'm asking you, I'm, in, I'm advising you, as you're heading into 2019, as you're carrying around a burden that should be long gone, deal with it today. Go to that person and say, listen, I forgive you. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know why I'm taking this around, but I really do forgive you. And move on. Go into 2019 with a desire to serve the Lord Jesus even more.